Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us for our final webinar episode, Is History Repeating Itself? Exploring the Black Experience and Redevelopment in Canada. It is my pleasure to welcome you all and to open our session tonight because we have an exciting session uh, that features many wonderful guest speakers, as well as community leaders from various communities across the city. Before we go any further, I'd like to just take a moment to land us in the space by offering our land acknowledgement. So it is important that we acknowledge that the land that we are standing on this evening and that we are meeting on virtually is traditionally known by the Indigenous peoples as Takaranto, which means the place where the water in the water where the trees stand. Takaranto is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. It's been important for us here to acknowledge that as we talk about redevelopment of communities across Canada, and particularly Black communities across Canada, that we acknowledge that the land that we have been invited here on has many deep roots, belonging, and history that has enabled, enabled us to be here together. I'd also like to take a moment to invite Randell Ajay to guide us through our African ancestral acknowledgement. Good evening, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well today. This land acknowledgement is something that has been uh, something that I've been using for the last little while. We also acknowledge that all treaty peoples, including those who came here as settlers, as migrants, either in this generation or in generations of the past. And those of us who came here involuntarily, particularly forcibly displaced Africans brought here as a result of the transatlantic slave trade and slavery. Today, I pay tribute to those ancestors and African or African origin and descent. Wonderful. And thank you so much, Randell. I know that you are going to be back as well throughout the evening. So before we go any further and proceed with our scheduled events for the evening, I would like to uh, take a moment just to say hi. My name is Kadeen Bankasing, and I'm one of the team from North York Community House that has been working together to coordinate this uh, webinar series uh, for all of you. We began our conversations and our dialogue in October, and as you can see, on October 4th, and really wanted to use our first session as an opportunity to land us in this conversation and in this dialogue around Black communities and redevelopment in Canada. And so we started our conversation joined by Evelyn Amponsa, who is a PhD candidate and was our expert, content expert on histories of Black communities in Canada. And we really explored Africville as one of our historically Black communities that had met its fate at the hands of redevelopment in the, 19, in the early 1970s. We were also joined by Denise Bishop Earle, who is a Lawrence Heights longtime resident, elder, and knowledge keeper who shared her experience with us about being a resident leader and community animator in the very early days of Lawrence Heights revitalization. Thank you so much, Katie, and thank you so much, everyone, for being here. My name is Paida, and I am the community engagement worker. Uh, my role is to strengthen community assets uh, through building a community asset map, also involve Western Mount Dennis residents and some of the developments happening in our neighborhood. So our spotlight for week number two was what is gentrification? And so we really uh, spotlighted Weston and Mount Dennis neighborhood. We explored the history and the significance of the Kodak factory and how it brought new settlers to the area and how its revitalization, especially with the LRT, is uh, predominantly affecting Black uh, businesses in the neighborhood. And we had Neologic Donaldson also walk us through what that really looks like um, in the context of Little Jamaica. And then, of course, we had a uh, former Mount Dennis resident himself, Cuddy Duncan, unpack some of those really important definitions and bring in uh, real life examples. 
We also looked at Hogan's Alley, which was in Vancouver, a black neighborhood that was completely uh, destroyed in 1967 because of the building of the freeway. And um, since the end of Hogan's Alley, there's no black neighborhoods that have existed in Vancouver. Thank you so much, Pida. So good evening, everyone. My name is Shannon, and I'm the Strong Neighborhood Coordinator for Lawrence Heights, Neptune, and Lauderton. One important aspect of my work is collaborating with residents to preserve the community in which they live in and cherish. And in session three, our team was just that, preserving heritage in Canada. We featured the historically Black community, Little Burgundy, in Montreal, and that was demolished to put an expressway. We also featured Little Jamaica or Eglinton West, which is currently undergoing development due to the Metrolinx LRT construction. We were honored to have guest presenters from Black Urbanism TO, Dane Williams and Ruth Belay, to break down community heritage and preservation for us, while highlighting the importance of opportunities to support Black prosperity. We ended our session with an interview with Little Jamaica resident and business owner Jason McDonnell, who shared his lived experiences of the changes and redevelopment that is happening in Little Jamaica right now and throughout the past few years. Good evening, everyone. My name is Chantal Hindman, and I'm the OSN coordinator for Weston and Mount Dennis. Week four, we featured Salem's Chapel, which is a prominent church in St. Catharines, Ontario, um, which was also the final stop to the Underground Railroad that was led by Harriet Tubman, um, as well as um, highlighted Regent Park, which is a community in Toronto. We were joined by Ibrahim Afra, who is a prominent uh, resident leader within Regent Park, as well as community organizer and worker uh, Juliet Allen, who came to discuss uh, ways that we can mobilize community and preserve uh, heritage. So thank you, Chantel, for that uh, review. So we've had so many great sessions so far and presentations and discussions over the past few weeks. And today we are wrapping it up with a resident panel to talk about organizing for community benefits. So we're starting off our session today with some wise words and poetry from R Randall Ajay, Poet Laureate of Ontario, transformational speaker and arts educator. We also have Kumsa Baker from Toronto Community Benefits Network, who will give us a brief background into community benefits. Kumsa will also be moderating our resident panel tonight. We are pleased to have five amazing resident leaders to be part of our discussion tonight. We have Trudy Ann Powell from Lawrence Heights. Also from Lawrence Heights, we have Balkis Pahashiru. We have Stephen Mensah from Western Mount Dennis. Returning, we have Ibrahim Afra from Regent Park. And we have Berla Mark from Parkdale. So thank you to our guests for coming out tonight. And we have a really packed agenda. So I just want to go straight into the next section of our night today. Thank you. So I'm going to call on Chantel, who is going to introduce our first guest yes. presenter for the evening. Thank you, Katie. And so our first guest, I am very honored to welcome him to our virtual stage, a longtime friend of mine, uh, amazing, amazing community builder, an amazing man, and definitely somebody who is extremely important in our community. So I want to welcome the transformational speaker, the spoken word practitioner, the arts educator, the first poet laureate of Ontario, Randall Ajay. He is an entrepreneur, speaker, and spoken word practitioner who uses his gifts to empower the message of alchemy. He was recently appointed as Ontario's first African poet laureate. Randall is the founder of one of Toronto's largest youth-led initiatives, Reaching Intelligent Souls Everywhere, which many people know um, commonly as RISE Edutainment. In 2018, RISE received the Ontario Arts Foundation Mayor's Youth Arts Award. Randall is also the author of I Am Not My Struggles, a powerful anthology released in 2018. He was also named CBC's Metro Mornings Torontonian of the Year in 2015 and Now Magazine's Local Hero in May 2017. In 2020, just recently, Randall opened up for, the, for President Barack Obama at the Economic Club of Canada. So you guys can all see why we are so honored to have him with us tonight. And without further ado, I would love to pass on the virtual mic and stage to Randall. The floor is yours. Hello and good evening, everyone. As mentioned, thank you so much for being here today. It is incredibly important that we continue to have these conversations about what it means to mobilize 
what it means to overcome and what it means to ensure that the future of our Black community, our African communities have a smoother path to walk on. When I think about mobilizing and activism in our community, I think one of the things that comes to mind first is really around this notion of what is it that we're mobilizing around or against or about. So I think about a couple terms and I think about a couple things that I think are really important to keep in mind when it comes to mobilizing. When it comes to those who we look to serve, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to better understand where they are coming from, to understand their lived experiences, to understand how they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, we all know, but of course the experiences of our people is has many shades, pun intended, many shades when it comes to how we deal with and navigate through our Blackness, our Africanness. I wanna start with like a bit of a little story with you. When I was a little younger, um, I, I grew up and was raised in Ghana from one to six years old. It was probably one of the best years of my life, given the opportunity to learn about my ancestry, to learn about my heritage, where I came from, and the love that is just permeating through Africa, specifically Ghana, Accra, Ghana. And I grew up there from one to six. When I came here to Canada, I was really told that my Africanness was not welcomed, that the flies that were on our faces needed to stay back in Africa, that I had to go back to Africa. And I think one of the difficulties there is that it taught me to not love who I am and where I came from. It taught me to forget where I came from, to forget the love that I came from in terms of what my family and my community was pushing out. And I think to now, things are very different. We are more unified, but we still have a long way to go. This first poem that I wanna share with you is called The Plight. And what it speaks on is essentially speaks on some of the difficulties and challenges that many of us have had to navigate in terms of dealing with the oppression in our community, dealing with the systematic oppression, but not only the systematic oppression, but also the, the racial tensions that we constantly have to navigate through. This is called the plight. In this Western world where war is waged, we wear our wounds like warriors. Hearts on sleeves, we wear our wounds like tattoos lit, written across our iris. We see the world in a peaceful violence, yet speak of the world in the ways in which we've been silenced. Like how they erect women like queens, then Mirandize a lady's liberties in a New York minute. Strip you bare of your culture and ethnicity. Tell you you are free, yet criminalize you before you're proven guilty. They treat innocence like business. Breaking bonds then stock people in cells like product then trade you when they lose interest. The price we pay in exchange for freedom. The American dream is a war between spirit and sin we've yet to wake up from. This dream is a nightmare for us melanated beings who walk in the light. We are immigrants who left our rights at the borders we cross. We came from broken land to stolen land, this true north strong and free. This economic monopoly to commodify me, this land has clouded my vision, clouded my melanin and made me feel blue. Man, they blackmail me with white lies and I'm in search of truth, in search of change, no purple rain. They are yellow bellied cowards green with envy. People who'd rather see me on gray concrete, soulless and empty as my red blood runs towards a pot of gold, a fleeting rainbow that colors the canvas of a 2000 year old genocide. The paintbrush, a gun they use like exercise to run this country. Race is a fundraise marathon that's gotten the world off track. Race is a fundraise marathon that's gotten the world off track. Too many issues to get a reparations back for being black and excellent. They kill black bodies and extract our melanin for medicine. We are lab rats in a social experiment. They put fluoride in our water to make us docile and climate and chemicals in our food we cannot pronounce. But that's the stuff we need to keep out of our mouth. They use our names as bonds of ownership. That's why they capitalize our names so they can capitalize on our names. We are modern day slaves in search of freedom. Growing up in the six, when I was seven, I knew brothers that never ate. So they started carrying your nods. Said so growing up in the six, when I was seven, I knew brothers that never ate. So they started carrying your nods. Like my best friend who started selling brought like my best friend who started selling rocks and sold them to burners. He started packing the heat because the waves were getting cold and now I don't condone selling poison to make a living, but they don't control the drugs that cross these borders into this newer order. 
Obama succeeded the snakes in the bush, but only for America to pull the Trump card when we didn't look. Like a game of president is politics. That's why sometimes I'm hesitant to vote just in case they ain't true, though. So I fear the world my children will inherit. I fear the world my children will inherit. So I do my best before they come, before I perish to be the change I wish to see. So I wear my heart on my sleeves. Tattooed across my skin are my wounds of this utopia, I believe, in hopes of brighter tomorrows. Because every sunrise, a Black mother's nature is mourning the death of her son at his wake. Mourning has become a ritual of survival, a coping mechanism, a means of honoring our reincarnated ancestors because life and death coexist in the form of faith and breath. In the fleeting moment of an inhale, a reminder it is a gift to be alive. Despite the, taint, despite the pain tattooed behind my eyes, here I stand. Tattooed across my skin are my wounds, the plight of this African Canadian man. Thank you, that was a plight. Um, the first poem that I wanted to share with you all today. The thing I shared a little earlier about figuring out what the problem is and taking the opportunity to better understand the problem is this. In life, I've recognized that adversity is inevitable. It means that despite the color of our skin, despite what shade, what creed, what beliefs, what religions, what lived experiences we have had, all of us at some point in our lives will experience hardship and hardship and adversity do not discriminate. But because they do not discriminate, I think the reality comes down to what is it that we can do when these experiences come, when we experience adversity? What can we learn? How can we build? How can we grow? Because I'm sure for all of you have a story of resilience, a story of adversity that you've gone through that has allowed you to be where you are today, that has shaped you and prepared you to be a better person, a better listener, a better lover, better care, better, better father, better daughter, better sister, whatever it is. And I think it's important to understand that in every adversity we go through, that there is a seed of opportunity, that there's something we can take away, take out of and learn from, that we don't go through these hardships just because we deserve to be experiencing this, but because there's an opportunity to build and grow and be better. And so it reminds me of this analogy, the analogy of a seed. We all know that a seed can turn into just about anything. It can turn into a flower. It can turn into a rose, anything, you know, fruits, vegetables. But the beauty of a seed is that in order for the potential inside of that seed to really be able to bloom and blossom, what has to happen is that seed must be planted into the darkness of the soil. So the potential in that seed will then break after it is planted in the darkness of soil, after it breaks, what then happens is that it will root itself into the very darkness before it blooms and finds its light. So we are those seeds put in dark situations. But I think what's happened to us is that the potential inside of us is coming out. And I think that's what we're doing here today. We are mobilizing and learning how to root ourselves in the challenges we're going through to be able to find how we can overcome and how we can bloom out of this. At the end of the day, there is no light without darkness. There is no good without bad. And so we have to learn to see where the lessons are in this, how we can become alchemists and turn these rocky moments into golden opportunities. So in terms of turning golden or rocky moments into a golden opportunity, I have had the pleasure of being a part of a number of different entrepreneurial programs. And in as an entrepreneur, what I've learned is problems are great as an entrepreneur because it gives you an opportunity to work towards building a service and perhaps a product. But this concept that I've learned is applicable in our lives, not just in business, but in everyday life. And it's a concept called design thinking. And I, I, I'm not sure who may be familiar with this concept, but I just wanted to share because I think it's very important as we are mobilizing and as we're being activists in our communities to keep this frame of mind in mind. So first where we start off is we have to really learn that many of us are solution oriented, but before we can become solution oriented, there's something quite beautiful and powerful about learning more about the problem we're looking to solve. Many of us want to run from the problem because a problem can be difficult. 
The problem can be challenging. We don't want our friends or family members, nor do we want to experience these challenges. But the reality is the lesson is in the problem, that the beauty is in the problem, that the solution is in the problem. And so design thinking challenges us first to empathize with the problem. And in empathizing with the problem, what that looks like is taking the time, the opportunity to listen to those who are impacted by the problem, to understand where their lived experience is. And of course, we are all, if not all of us, many of us here are connected to the plight of our people, to the racism and the challenges that we've gone through in all the different sectors that we're looking to solve. But I think in talking to others, in understanding their lived experiences and navigating through what the problem looks like and essentially learning to love the problem. I know that I'm like, what do you mean by learning to love the problem? But in learning to love the problem, we can come up with a better solution. So what learning to love the problem can look like as an example, or for example, is doing the research of how these problems are affecting everyday people on a day-to-day -day basis. So we can start there. We empathize and learn to understand what it is they're navigating through. And even, even more so as difficult as this may sound, those who benefit from our problems. If we can understand how these people are benefiting from our problems, I'm sure many of us have an idea, but on a deeper level, can we really take the time to understand what it is that's happening and why these individuals choose to continue to perpetuate these problems? The second is to take the opportunity to define the problem. There's many problems that are happening in our community, but can we take the opportunity to define the problem? to better understand what the problem is. So first we empathize, then we define and understand this is the problem. So we define the problem, we create a problem statement and we work from there. From there, we begin to ideate. We begin to ideate by thinking of what are some things that we can do to really help to get to a place of, of a solution. So we think through, we ideate, and afterwards we take the opportunity to essentially prototype the problem. We prototype the problem by thinking of ideas and solutions that could work towards it. After prototyping, we then test, take the opportunity to test to see if this is what we want to do. And then you bring it back to those you're looking to work with. And I say this because although there's many shades to how we navigate through what it is we're dealing with, not all of us are dealing with it the same way. So you bring it back to those you're looking to support and, so, and, and, and support, essentially support and see if it is the best way and that we're not working for people, but we're trying to work with them ultimately. So that's the concept of design thinking. And I thought it was really important to share because it's helped me in so many different ways. It's how I was able to build rise in recognizing some of the issues that were happening in Scarborough. I have a couple more poems that I'd like to share with you before I wrap up today. Um, and the next poem I wanna share is called Brokenness. Um, I find it kind of, in a, in a nutshell, really wraps up what I was talking about around design thinking, and this is Brokenness. I know too many broken people, broke into pieces they think they cannot fix. Like shattered glass, they may cut you when you try to uplift, slicing the helping hands, hoping to heal the harm that's happened to them. They often hurt in silence, smile in your face today, but tomorrow you may hear of how their brokenness has escalated into acts of violence. We often judge these broken people and call them names, label them sometimes forgetting that like flipping a coin, they too can change. But what does it really mean to be broken when it is broken people that have helped mend the world? I realize that in our brokenness is when our true lives unfurl. Because see, brokenness, brokenness is a sign of recreation. It is a sign of growth. But we fear brokenness because we fear the unknown and the uncertainty. But brokenness can piece our holes together perfectly, sometimes permanently. After all, if you've never known brokenness, then how would you know when you were whole? If you've never been broken, then how would you measure your growth? Thank you, that was brokenness. I hope that uh, resonated with you in some way, shape or form. Uh, this next piece I wanna share is just kind of uh, a spinoff of um, a Black History Month poem that I wrote, just speaking about race and how we navigate race on a day-to-day -day basis. Race is but a figment of our imaginations. What are we chasing? Mental enslavement. Imagine if we open up our third eyes and saw past the faces past too many colored lines of segregation. It wouldn't matter if you read the signs or blew your chance, see it's still the matrix. The color of my skin does not define who I am. My ancestors fought for this land so I could stand, see those in power, no knowledge of self can divide up their plans. That's why the system won't teach us about ourselves. 
I think it's a scam. They teach us how to work for wage, but not how to manage or invest. The industrial revolution made us economic slaves. That's why they take credit for cashing your checks. But see, we still got to live our lives right until we have nothing left. Because see, money, money is not the root of all evil. The addiction to it is. And they're commercializing childhood and selling materialism to the kids, teaching them to be consumers before they learn to plant a seed into their future. In my neighborhood, we grew up thinking that happiness was found in material possessions. And a couple of my friends grew up thinking that the solutions to their problems were found in automatic weapons. See, bullets had mother stressing and fear had us guessing until I learned to tap into my spirit to find the answers to my questions. See, we are all reflections of one another. You are my reflection. You are my reflection. You are my reflection. We are all reflections of one another. Conceived, the Eve, the, eight, the Adam was able to walk without a cane. So now ask yourself, what is love without pain? What is love without pain? What is pain without love? What is love without pain? And I guess I wanna wrap my, uh, my time here with you today by saying, we all have an opportunity to leave a lasting legacy, to mobilize, to activate in our communities and make a tremendous difference. Our ancestors, as we look to them and what they've done for us, how they have created opportunities for us to be here, even on Zoom, to congregate, to speak, to mobilize and to move towards a better future. As we look to our ancestors, I think it's important to recognize that one day if we choose and if we are blessed to, we all have the opportunity to be someone's ancestor. And that in being someone's ancestor, we can create a path that will make it a little bit easier for them, that your legacy is every day, that you are building that dash every single day in terms of what your legacy looks like. And so I wanna thank you all for having me today. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you to everyone that's here today in terms of your support. It means a lot. And I'm extremely grateful to have had the opportunity to share and be here today. And I look forward to what the panel has in store. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Randall. I think I can speak for us all, um, especially for those of us who've had the opportunity to hear you speak. Um, the pleasure and honor of hearing you speak. You are truly beautifully poetic. Um, and thank you for those, those closing words. I think it perfectly leads us into the next portion of the evening. And once again, thank you so much for joining us. If you're able to stay with us, that'd be great. And now I'll pass it on to my colleague, Paida. Thank you so much, Randall. That was very beautiful. Um, a, la a piece that really stuck out to me, one of your poems was, this lad has clouded my vision. And it's so pertinent to what we are doing here today to uncloud some of those really complicated definitions, especially when it comes to um, gentrification and that redevelopment of land and really move into some community visioning. Um, that was just well, really well said and beautifully written. So thank you so much, Randall. And now we are going to move into some community visioning and community benefits framework with Kunza Bakar. He is the director of campaigns at the Toronto Community Benefits Network, TCBN. The TCBN is a 120 member and growing coalition of community organizations, grassroots groups, and social enterprises, labor unions, construction trades, training centers, and workforce development agencies whose goal is to negotiate community benefits agreements as part of new urban infrastructure and development projects. Welcome Kumza, thank you so much. And he'll be leading and moderating our panel discussion today. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Paida, uh, and good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, to be part of such a important discussion as it relates to uh, redevelopment, uh, especially as, it's, uh, as it relates to its impact uh, on uh, black, indigenous and racialized communities in Toronto. Me, myself, I'm with uh, an organization called the Toronto Community Benefits Network, and we were an organization that's been established since about 2014. So we're going into our seventh year. And, um, you know, a key focus of the Toronto Community Benefits Network when we had established was looking at, you know, all of the different developments that were happening in, in neighborhoods across the city, many of them with, which are uh, predominantly uh, Black, Indigenous and racialized uh, communities. Uh, where there, you know, severe impacts, you know, when it comes to development, you know, I think even with uh, some of the previous sessions uh, that you were able to unpack, you know, when it comes to uh, development impact on neighborhoods like Little Jamaica, 
uh, and some of the businesses along the Little Jamaica and Eglinton corridor, you know, who were severely impacted by the Eglinton Crosstown LRT project and other examples from across Canada in terms of, you know, the Black community and 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 some of the severe impacts, you know, that development has happened uh, has had on on the Black community, and so. You know, as we see uh, across the city of Toronto, you know, more development happening. Uh, and I know a, a big focus of, of the conversation is around the Mount Dennis and Weston neighborhood where, you know, coming from this new LRT project, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of development, you know, happening. Uh, and we have a few panelists uh, who are going to be here today uh, who will be sharing more about, you know, how are they, uh, you know, involving their voice, you know, when it comes to development in their neighborhoods to really push and advocate and mobilize to make sure that, you know, development is equitable and it actually, you know, addresses some of the real uh, uh, needs and concerns that people may have, uh, you know, when it comes to um, uh, community benefits. There's an opportunity when it comes to development to really harm community. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of times that happens because our communities are not at the table. You know, we're not in those spaces where decisions are being are being made. Uh, you know, how do we uh, better hold, you know, our decision makers accountable, you know, when they're involved in development and, and involved in, in uh, influencing the change in our neighborhood? And uh, how do we ensure that, you know, uh, recognizing that development can harm our community, how can we make sure that we have intentional processes and measures uh, and commitments in place uh, to really uh, eliminate, you know, some of those impacts, you know, and, and so a lot of times it's really important uh, that our community's voice is at the table, you know, when decisions are, are being made and when development happens to make sure that our priorities are, are addressed. And so I wanted to, before we get into the panel uh, section today, I want to share a, a really great video uh, that from a speaker in the U.S. Uh, her name is Lauren Jacobs, and she's with a uh, organization called Power Shift Action. Uh, and she's part of U.S.-wide network of coalitions and groups who are actively engaged in uh, mobilizing for community benefits as part of a uh, new development in, in many uh, large-scale municipalities. And I think, um, you know, she has some really powerful words to share in terms of giving some context in terms of, you know, some of the different impacts that development has acted uh, many Black communities across the U.S., and especially in some of the larger municipalities, as well as some of the work that they've been able to do in terms of mobilizing to really ensure that there's a community voice at the table. And so I'll share the video. It's part of a uh, webinar series that the Toronto Community Benefits Network is hosting. And I'll also post the full video after if you want to sort of watch the full 25-minute video recap. The session is called Building Just and Sustainable Communities um, Through Community Benefits. And so I'll play the video, and then I think it'll be a good segue into the conversation that we'll have with our panelists today. So as Rosemary said, my name is Lauren Jacobs. And for those who do not know Power Switch Action, yes, we're a network. We have 20 dynamic power building organizations. They want to talk a little bit about what they do because I think it gets to this heart of why community benefits, um, why was this tool developed in this network? Our affiliates really weave together different movement streams and their straits and metropolitan regions. And they do that with a real goal of achieving our collective dreams and deep desires for a deep multiracial feminist democracy. When we talk about democracy, we talk about a democracy where we know and embrace that every human is precious and deserving of dignity, that we have a feminist approach that values both work and home, industry and community, and economic security and environmental stability, and a multiracial society that really embraces and celebrates our diverse cultures, languages, and perspectives, and embraces that as a strength. And so I'm really proud to work with such an amazing group of 20 organizations who are committed to justice, um, or as others say, to practicing love in public. So I know the point of our um, conversation this evening is to talk about community benefits agreements and how they've been a critical tool for local and county governments but also really importantly, working people in their neighborhoods. Lane is one of the four affiliates that co-founded our network. And this is a tool that Lane actually developed. And it was a means to, by which, you know, communities could come together, harness the power that local government had to ensure equity and smart development. 
And I do believe you have to look at sort of what were the material conditions happening at the moment that this was created to sort of understand it. And then I think it sort of starts to point to where we might think about going. But if we think back on that period in the late 90s and the early 2000s, Lane and other partners were in the midst of it, well, all of us were in the midst of an incredible economic development boom where we had in the US so many, in many cases, local and county government officials sort of throwing themselves at developers, looking for opportunities to get their photo shot with the ribbon cutting. And so there were incredible, um, you know, subsidies sort of given to new developments, right? So we're going to give you either um, give you a subsidy, give you a tax abatement, do tax increment financing, sell off our land, all of the things. And there wasn't a path. What um, started to happen is that some of the local government officials sort of attached to this and the developers sort of locked in a way that locked out community and worker voices from, the, from the, these developments. So this was a means about how we actually reclaim land, the land, <laughs> as a sort of commons that everybody has a stake in and ensure that all of the stakeholders, the whole community govern and co-govern. Um, in one case, one of our affiliates actually won a code order. Awesome. Uh, I won't show the full video, but I think that, you know, it's a really great sort of uh words i think to really ground uh the panel discussion for today and and i think you know one of the the key things that you know really stood out to me is is learning from you know the work that's happening in the us around community benefit organizing and she was speaking about an organization called lean uh which is a short form for los angeles uh alliance for a new economy so it's a, a group based out of uh, los angeles you know but you know really you know uh you know focusing on the theme of how do we reclaim land as well as you know how do we make sure that you know as you know, we see this big economic development boom in our city, right? Um, you know, if you look across the city of Toronto, the last 10 years, you know, homes are, you know, have become so expensive. You know, there's a certain uh, set of few people who are, you know, are doing really well and are continuing to do well. But while, while others, especially those who are in the Black uh, racialized uh, Indigenous communities who are continuing to, to struggle in our city, uh, and so, you know, you know, a lot of times we'll hear this in different data and reports when it comes to inequality in our city and, and the rise of inequality in our city. Um, and so uh, using community benefit agreements, you know, how can we really make sure that we're addressing some of the biggest challenges in our city right now when it comes to addressing inequality, you know, when it comes to addressing affordable housing, when it comes to addressing the importance of, say, of supporting our local businesses, especially our diverse owned businesses, you know, when development happens. You know, when it comes to things like community spaces that are community governed uh, and controlled. Um, and so these are all important questions that when development happens that need to be asked, you know, uh, and that and why it's so important that our community's voice uh, is needed at the table. Uh, and so I think this is a good segue to uh, introduce uh, the panelists uh, for uh, today's session. Uh, we have speakers who are going to be here with us from uh, Lawrence Heights, Parkdale, Regent Park. And, and so um, I think it'll be a good opportunity to hear more about, um, you know, some of the, the real work that's happening in, in, the, in these neighborhoods, as well as uh, how the community is mobilizing to make sure that their voices are heard, you know, wh when these type of decisions are, are, are happening. Um, and so I'll turn it over to Paida. Okay. Thank you so much, Kumsa. We're going to be listening to uh, Zakisha Brown. She is a Toronto-born uh, uh, artist who's of Jamaican descent, and she's globally recognized uh, for her hip hop, her delivery in music, self-development, and the urgency of the stories that she tells through art. Uh, and she's also known for her lyricism, her delivery of bars and flow as a hip hop artist. So please enjoy her latest single, The Shift. Shift. It's time for a shift. This is the shift. Big change, big things in the phase. Yeah. Big change, big things in the phase. Yeah. Big change, big things in the phase. Yeah. In the phase. Yeah. This is the shift, 
vibrations been raised. New friends, old friends part ways. Embrace new change. Heal, cry, purge, fly, feel. Separate the fake from what's real. Accept the red flags for red flags and peel. Don't stick around just to stick around. Let's be real. Trust your intuition and what it's telling you for real. What's the deal while we kill our own self-worth? Had to ask myself, had to put my own self first. Tired of the self-hurt, so I put in that self-work. Tired of the self-hurt, so I put in that self-work. Tired of the self-hurt, so I put in that. Yeah, this is the shift. Big change, big things, a new phase. Yeah, big change, big things, a new phase. Yeah, big change, big things, a new phase. Yeah, a new phase. Yeah. This is the shift, so welcome to a new age, age of Aquarius, welcome to a new day, consciousness been raised, we changing how we do things, balancing the mood swings, we living in a new way, new life and a new aim, new fame and a new wave, ego was maintained, not looking just to be praised, fell down so many times and bounced back like Luke Cage, today I'm tired, tomorrow I'm okay, okay, new frame of mind, cause I've been through some dark days, some days were insane, so I walk with some new sage, some days were insane, hard to stay sane, but I maintain. Some days were cray cray, hard to stay sane, but I maintain. The shift, big change, big things in your face. Yeah, big change, big things in your face. Yeah, big change, big things in your face. Yeah, in your face. Yeah, this is the shift. Big change, big things in your face. Yeah, big change, big things in your face. Yeah, big change, big things in your face. Yeah, big face. Yeah. This is the shift, so welcome to a new earth. We manifested this. We changing how we view work, cause nine to five ain't it. We tapped into our own worth, we owning businesses. We put our mental health first, the paradigm has switched. We owning up to self-hurt, we learned our lessons quick. We grown and doing self-work, it's a rebirth. Cause we tapped in and we turned on and we tuned in to a new song. It's been too long, the self-hate is long gone. It's a new dawn and a new wave and a new age. New rules that we remade, old rules need to cremate. Time to create, time to be brave, I told you. It's a new day, told you it's a new way, told you it's a new wave in a new age, it's a new day, shift. Yeah, we made it, y'all. <laughs> Welcome to a new age. We changing how we do things. <laughs> it's a new phase. It's a new phase. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Afra, uh, and I'm a resident of Region Park. Uh, Region Park has been my community uh, since I moved into Canada from Somalia. Uh, I've been here since 2001, uh, so I've never lived in other communities. So region, I've been here since um, before revitalization had begun. Moved away, thankfully, to uh, the next door community for about a year. Uh, then they moved us back in because uh, we were lucky to be one of those uh, that came early. What some of the work that I do in the community is uh, because of so much effort in the, something called the social development plan. I'm right now a full um, coordinator for the communications of Region Park. Uh, I also do a lot of volunteering uh, and some of the volunteer work that I do involves community benefit. Uh, for phases one, two, and three, Region Park, there was not a lot of activity in terms of organizing, uh, but these last phases, uh, there's, there's a coalition, community benefit coalition that's really working hard in trying to get a community benefit and the community really to decide what those benefits are. And so thank you, and I will be talking to you more about it as we go. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ibrahim, for that uh, great introduction, and, and thank you for all the work that you do in, in your community. I would like to introduce uh, the next panelist, um, and uh, we have uh, Beryl Ann, uh, who's with us today from Parkdale. Um, and so thank you so much, Beryl Ann, for being here with us today, and uh, uh, you can take it away. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Beryl Ann Mark, and uh, I live in the Parkdale community for the past 27 years. My pronouns are she, her, and um, part of uh, Mutual Aid Parkdale. We started an initiative called Mutual Aid Parkdale at the onset of the pandemic. We partner with the Toronto Rugby Brigade to buy groceries for residents um, who were scared to get out or who were COVID-19 positive. And I'm part of a group called Parkdale Women Leadership Group also. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carol Ann, for introducing yourself. And thank you so much for all the amazing work that you do in 
in Parkdale. The next panelist that we have with us is uh, Stephen, uh, who comes from the Western Mount Dennis neighborhood uh, and who is also a youth leader uh, in his community. Uh, and so Stephen, welcome to today's session. Uh, and yeah, please feel free to introduce yourself. Thank you, Kumsa. Uh, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. So as mentioned, my name is Stephen. I live in the, uh, as mentioned, the Western Mount Dennis community. And I also serve as the executive director of the Toronto Youth Cabinet, the city of Toronto's official youth advisory body, uh, as well as serving as a youth director on the board of directors for a local nonprofit organization in Western Mount Dennis called For Youth Initiative. Uh, and yeah, I'm just glad to be here and just uh, excited for the conversation. So it's a pleasure. Awesome. Thank you so much uh, for being here with us today, uh, Stephen. And um, it's so great to have a youth voice and perspective in this conversation because I feel sometimes that's missing. And, you know, thank you so much for the work that you do in terms of supporting youth leadership and, and, and yourself being a, a youth leader uh, in the Toronto community. It's uh, uh, definitely recognized. The next panelist uh, that we have with us today or the next two panelists, um, we have uh, Trudy Ann, uh, who's here with us from the Lawrence Heights community. Uh, welcome, Trudy Ann. And yeah, feel free to uh, share a few words and introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi everyone, good evening. Um, as introduced by Kumsa, my name is Trudy Ann Powell. I'm a Lawrence Heights resident for the past 21 years. I love to tell people I'm a mother hawk because I remember when there was a youth trampling the ground being in Lawrence Heights before even residing in Lawrence Heights and running the ground, you know, circling and all the place been changing up um, so much, it's unbelievable. But I'm here tonight um, to share some knowledge with you and engage in some great um, discussion. My pronoun, my gender pronoun is she, her, or Hella Francais. So that's me. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Trudy Ann, and, and welcome to the conversation. And uh, I know you wear many hats in, in the Lawrence Heights community. So thank you all for the really amazing work that you do. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, Balikis, uh, who's here with us also from the Lawrence Heights Lotherton neighborhood. And uh, Balikis is also a youth leader uh, in her community. So uh, Balikis, uh, welcome and uh, feel free to share uh, your introduction and, and a little bit more about yourself. Hello everyone, my name is Balikis and uh, I'm from the Lawrence Heights community. I've been a community member now for about 15 years. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, and in terms of uh, community engagement, I am part of the advisory board for the social development plan for the Lawrence Heights community. And I also sort of get involved in different ways um, across all areas of, uh, I guess, community development. So yeah, I just like to be an active member of the community. And I'm extremely excited to be here today. Welcome so much to this um, conversation and um, thank you for all the amazing work that you do in your neighborhood. I'm looking forward to hearing more from all the panelists. And so uh, once again, uh, we have uh, five panelists uh, for today's session. Um, and so for the first question, um, you know, what does equitable development look like in you in your neighborhood? Um, you know, what are your priorities in your neighborhood at the current moment? And uh, how can you ensure that uh, some of these uh, key community priorities and needs are addressed as you know, your neighborhood is changing? And so uh, I know in Regent Park with the, the Toronto Community Housing's uh, phases four and, and five of revitalization, uh, there's some really amazing work happening in Regent Park. And so, um, uh, Ibrahim, would you be able to maybe share more about um, sort of Regent Park and, and what's happening as well as what is the community's vision uh, for revitalization? So just to give you a little bit context, uh, when Regent Park was being developed, uh, the idea was that uh, we will not be developing just brand new buildings. Uh, that now is going to house not just Toronto community housing, but also residents across the city with socio different economic statuses. Uh, so when this community, we wanted to envision a community that is uh, cohesive uh, when they are coming together and inclusionary. Uh, the vision was that um, everybody uh, will come together. And that is why uh, the first social development plan was put together. Uh, the community, uh, because of the question you're asking me, what I really think equitable inclusion is that when when these when when this community is being built, that there is a focus on not just the wealthy, uh, that there is a focus on everyone, 
uh, you're not just building, uh, to start with, you're not just building physically beautiful homes for the rich, that when you are building these homes that they look the same. Uh, even though some of the physical structures of the community, um, Toronto community buildings are being housed, uh, the idea was that all of these physical buildings look identical. Uh, some of the other issues that we really uh, inclusion, we want inclusion on was that every resident uh, can come back to Regent Park, that, uh, that when you are moved away, that you, are, you, you have a right to return. Uh, this was a document that was signed uh, that really uh, helps uh, Re Regent Parkers come back home. Uh, but there's different, uh, uh, when, when you move away and it takes a long time for these buildings to be built, some people cannot come back. Uh, their status have changed. And that is some of the concerns that I've been hearing that uh, uh, not everybody is coming back. And I really wanna focus on why that is happening. Uh, the community phases one and two and three, we are going through different phases. Uh, so the first phases, there was emphasis in the community having the basic amenities, like a swimming pool, like an athletic ground. Uh, so that was the focus. And organizations, uh, like big organizations that serve the community, they themselves did not have space. Uh, so these last phases that we are going through right now, phases four and five, a priority has to be focused into uh, residents who are grass, grassroots. Uh, they are right now occupying uh, the basements of the old TCHC buildings. Some of these facilities, uh, uh, when, once they are gone, uh, they're not coming back. So the priority for this neighborhood is that A, these people are documented and, and they have also a right to return. Uh, there is also uh, uh, a lot of home ownership that last time uh, some few community members did not get access to home ownership. So we wanna increase how many people get home ownership. We also wanna focus on uh, employment opportunities, uh, full-time employment opportunities and really documented these benefits in terms of uh, full-time opportunities. Uh, there is also money that has been identified by Toronto Community Housing and Tridel, which is our, um, our developers, uh, that will go directly to community benefit. And right now there's many negotiations happening uh, that this money be spent by uh, the community's own uh, vision. Uh, so when a whole one year process will go through of how to spend $28 million through employment, through scholarships, and through um, what we call the supporting the social development plan. Um, there have been some challenges uh, as any community goes through revitalization, but hopefully these challenges can be overcome uh, with the advocacy of this local community that we call uh, home. Thank you, Kumsa. Awesome, thank you so much, Ibrahim. <laughs> I will turn it over to uh, Beryl. Uh, so Beryl Ann, uh, if you can maybe share a little bit more about what's happening in Parkdale, uh, as well as what does equitable development look like for you in your community? Uh, and maybe share a little bit more about uh, some of the work happening in Parkdale as it relates to development and neighborhood change. Thank you. So as maybe most people know that Parkdale is going through uh, quite a bit of gentrification right now. Um, a lot of people are being displaced. Um, some developers, um, they actually are hardened apartments. You know, there are a lot of empty apartments, especially in West Lodge, that is empty based on, you know, the developers, you know, sometimes they go above um, rent guideline increases and people, so people aren't able to afford to pay the rent. What people would do is move out to the neighborhood, but then the landlord, they would actually, dub, you know, renovate their apartment and double the rent. And so they, want to probably have a, um, a different demographic, you know, people who could afford to pay, you know, the, the um, huge amounts uh, in rent. Currently, um, I know Park the People Economy, they, uh, in 2016, they did a, a committee planning study. So one of the things they do, they ask residents um, what they would like to experience in the community, what they would like to see, you know. And so out of that plan and study, they created a, a uh, community benefit framework. And so that community benefit framework, what it entails is people could share because anybody could access it. All you have to do is reach out to them and ask them for access to it. Uh, and they will share it with people. Uh, so what it, what it entails is letting de uh, developers know 
that residents in the community have different demands on what they want in the community or want they want the developers uh, to implement in the building. Uh, so they want, um, of course, decent work. Uh, they want a residents to uh, the developers to give a, a residents uh, first priority in being employed. Uh, um, they want uh, developers even to create commercial space for people to open businesses. And of course, one of the biggest one is create deeply affordable housing for residents in our community. Awesome. Thank you so much, Farhan, for sharing a little bit more about the context of Parkdale, as well as, you know, some of the real uh, impacts that development is happening on people and, and, and pushing people out of the neighborhood and also sharing more about Parkdale People's Economy. And, and for those who don't know about Parkdale People's Economy, I would highly encourage you to read more about them. Uh, who are really taking a proactive approach to development, right? Really developing a community vision uh, as part of the community benefits framework that they're now using as a set of demands uh, to engage developers. And uh, hopefully I think we'll, we'll hear a little bit more from that uh, as part of this conversation coming up. Awesome. So the next person I want to bring into this conversation is Trudy Ann Powell. So Trudy Ann, uh, can you share a little bit more about, um, you know, Lawrence Heights, uh, the community that you're from? Also, you know, what are some of the priorities that are in, in your neighborhood and, um, you know, how can you ensure that these uh, key priorities are addressed as the neighborhood is changing? Thank you very much, um, Kumsa. So when it comes to Lauren sites, um, just to give you a background there, I was um, one of what you call the original animators. This is before um, revitalization um, happened um, in Lawrence Heights. This is where we as an animator would go about and engage residents, um, get them on board, at that point, I didn't know anything about revitalization, gentrification. Those terminologies were new to me. Mind, mind you, I was a youth come in and engage. Anyways, get empowered um, through that whole process. Not only that, when about engage residents, normally, these are residents that normally wouldn't come on board, right? So put that face to it. And then, so that's where that started, right? Um, when you're talking about equitable development, for me, what I see here for residents in Lawrence sites is to have long-term opportunities that people are able to, to create social, financial, and even generational wealth. That's very important at this particular moment, right? And when I'm saying creating generational wealth, and not, not only that, I'm getting tongue-tied now because I want to encompass it, the whole social determinants of health. We have to talk about the well-being, the education of the people, right? And I'll give you an example. Um, back in 2013, I was one of the first cohorts for the Limitless Height Scholarship. At that time, being a young animator, you know, going to school and all of that stuff, um, developers put 500,000 um, upfront um, for, for the scholarship fund. So I was one of the first um, cohort there. So talking about equi equitable development is very important. And it's a great segue into talking about um, the priorities that we have here. At that time, 54% of the population, I'm talking about like 2013, even before that, 54% of the population of um, Lawrence Heights is youth, right? So now these youths are going through post-secondary education. And one of the, um, the priorities for Lawrence Heights residents is economic development, right? And economic development, things and times change. We're talking about inflation and so forth. So the residents are saying now we need at least $1 million, right, as a part of that economic development portion in terms of scholarship, right? Because we're talking about jobs and so forth. In, so I just want to make that clear, right? It's just the scholarship um, portion. So I just want to touch on that. Not only that, if you're talking about priorities, back in 2008, the Lawrence Sites residents um, have formulated the grassroots community priorities, right? And that document can't be go uh, can't go unnoticed. Um, for the mere fact, one of the main priorities and even though that was created in 2008, right now um, we have the tenants um, priorities, right? Which is you'll get privy to that and people get privy to that um, shortly. And as a, the main part of that, the main one of the main priority there is supporting a bottom up process, right? And when I'm talking about supporting a bottom up process is the only way is to level the playing field, working from the ground up, right? So that's some of the the things we're talking in Lawrence site. Not only that, I want to touch on something again. I, I'm not going to list all the different priorities, right? Because I could go on and on and on. But one of the main priorities 
as well here for residents and Lawrence site is affordable home ownership. Affordable home ownership. Back when, because we're in phase one at this particular moment, right? Initially, we have street naming process. The resident came about and say, hey, you know, these are the names we want. But then the city come back to us and say, hey, no, 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 you guys can't have those names. All right, we went back to the drawing board and some names that will come up. We have whole oil terraces coming up. Also, we have Turtle Island Road in Lawrence site. Talking about Turtle Island Road, right? And if we're gonna talk about land acknowledgement, right? We have black people, we have indigenous people been on this land here in Lawrence site. When I come to Lawrence site, I love rolling off Lawrence side for my, off my tongue, but amongst my counterpart, it could be jungle. You understand? But anyways, if we're talking about land acknowledgement, land acknowledgement right? It's very important for our people to start owning land in Lawrence sites, right? So one of the things right now we're working on the rent to own, right? We have the cabar, which is out right now. So that's a big priority for us here in Lawrence sites. So, and those are some of the things. Again, I could even talk about space, right? And to address these things, it's very important that we have a community benefits agreement and we're working hard, hard right now because phase two and phase three is not going to pass and the people don't get what they want. And it's about the people, right? Because if we don't have the physical structure here in Lawrence Heights to preserve our history, we need the people here to keep our history alive. It's beyond bricks and mortar. And if we say we don't have the bricks and mortar, we have to keep the people. The people need their housing. Again, if you're talking about social housing, portfolio, then people move up because of different policies and so forth. But if the people own their home, they're going to have that sense of pride within here and be able to create that generational wealth down the line. I'm going to cut right there because I'm getting so passionate. And I know, I hope you guys understand what I'm saying, because when I talk, very passionate, you know, the heart race and all, and all. but I'll leave it right there, but I'll follow up um, later on. Awesome. That was so powerful, Trudy. Thank you so much for uh, sharing, um, you know, a little bit of the perspective of your community in Lawrence Heights, as well as some of the work that you're doing, right, to really address, you know, some of the harms that is that have already been done, right, and and to make sure that, you know, um, I, th I think it's something that we're, we're already starting to hear a lot is around, uh, you know, how is land steward, uh, stewarded in, in the community, and how decisions are made, right? And, and how to make sure that the community's voice is involved, you know, from the bottom up uh, in informing, you know, what comes into the community and, and that goes beyond just the bricks and mortar. So, you know, thank you so much for reminding us about that as well as some of the work that the community continues to push on when it comes to uh, addressing systemic racism. You know, you mentioned the confronting anti-Black racism unit, you know, which was set up uh, uh, by the city of Toronto a few years ago, and and um, within the next week or two, there's going to be the formal launch of the uh, Center for Black Excellence at TCHC, you know, which will really focus on the issues of the Black community. And, and so hopefully that could be another great opportunity to really champion, you know, some of the issues that, you know, we continue to hear, especially with, you know, Black tenants of TCHC. I think this is a really good uh, conversation and a good, uh, I think, segue to maybe bring some of the youth uh, into this conversation. And so, Stephen, uh, I know you've been doing a lot of work in your neighborhood in uh, Western Mount Dennis, as well as across the city. And so, uh, you know, do you want to maybe share a little bit more about uh, the youth perspective in terms of uh, what you're seeing, as well as, you know, how development, uh, how development is impacting, you know, youth in our city? Be it its impact on young people or just um, all in all, like more specifically in my community, we talk about the Eglinton Crosstown LIT and how that has been decades is almost decades it seems like it's forever you know in the making to just finish up and just the negative impact it's had um, on our small businesses in the community uh, as well as when we talk about um, many of our members of the community facing high rates of displacement uh, you know due to the transit um, due to the transit construction and transit uh, development I say like specifically to young people um, when we talk about priorities and some things that I'm looking forward to is when we talk about um employment, you know, making sure that young people in the community are going to be able to benefit from the construction and just um, all of the jobs are going to be created uh, in the developments, whether it's the development of you know, new housing, the condos, whatever, or just the construction of the transit in of itself. I think that's something that's big uh, and that young people are uh, trying to get into. And um, I, um, and, and this is just a focus of myself to make sure that more young people are aware of 
the, just the opportunities that exist to with all of these developments. I'd say uh, another point of focus is when we talk about more spaces for young people to be engaged and uh, engaged, whether it's you know a community hub like a Jane and Finch, for example. I know they've been advocating for a central community hub for it, uh, for their community. So I, I don't know how that looks like within the Western Mount Dennis neighborhood, but just I'd say you know, more spaces and opportunities. Uh, for young people to just engage with amongst one another, however that may look like within our specific uh, community. Um, and I already you know, spoke about housing. I think ultimately what affects our parents is gonna impact us one way or another. And so when we see you know, rising um, housing costs and just rank, rank like this lack of rent control and, and all these other issues, you know, for instance, uh, you know, young people, young people see that, and they see it's affecting their parents. Obviously, it's going to have a toll on themselves. And just looking at York Southwestern, when the the youth employment rate is low, um, this poverty is something that is very um, rampant within our communities. I think uh, one thing one thing I'm really going to highlight, and one thing I have highlighted, is just the employment piece, employment piece, and making sure that uh, we benefit, be it during the process of construction and even after. Um, like I look at West Park Healthcare Center, for example, the construction of the new um, long-term care center, just let's try to see how we can get jobs in those hospitals after the construction is built, you know, whether it's, I think, I think that's the benefit of these community benefit agreements because you know, we can really speak to these type of issues and speak to some of the solutions and things that we really hope to see, um, whether it's in the process of development or after development is uh, is completed, so. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that, Stephen. And, um, you know, some really great examples in terms of, you know, what's possible, right, when it comes to, you know, including community in the development and also ensuring that there are actual economic opportunities, you know, for uh, the local community, especially with for equity seeking groups and at risk, at, at risk youth. And, you know, you highlight some, you know, a couple of good examples, like the West Park Healthcare Center, you know, which is a provincial project that uh, is the included community benefits agreement. And so it's really great to hear that, you know, that the conversations are even being explored even beyond just construction, right? They're going to have to hire new healthcare staff, you know, how can we make sure that, you know, maybe some of the new healthcare staff that are coming in, you know, some of them are really great jobs, you know, whether it's professional, administrative, technical jobs, so that the local community, you know, can get actually benefit from those opportunities. And how can we make sure that there's like, you know, strong economic development pathways, employment pathways, uh, especially for our at-risk youth in our community. Um, and so I will turn it over to Bali Kies. Um, uh, and uh, maybe if you wanted to jump in here and, and maybe share a little bit of your perspective to the conversation that we've had already. All right, yeah. So I think I'll just uh, talk about, I guess, both things that we've, uh discussed already so starting off from equitable development and what that looks like for me and my community um overall like one of the key things when we think about equitable developments is um having a community where you know everyone feels safe um where people have access to jobs people have access to affordable housing um just a place where we're trying to at least, or at least we're working on eliminating racial inequities, right? Um, for me, those are some of the key things that come up when I think about uh, an equitable sort of development um, as a whole. And when I think about some of the priorities in Lawrence Heights, um, just like many of the other panelists have mentioned, and as Trudy I mentioned as well, being from Lawrence Heights as well herself, um, one of the key things for us is affordable housing. That piece of affordable housing. Um, I know in the beginning of the, the development, you know, many, you know, many people in the community were promised that people would have access to home ownership. Um, and at the end of it, I think uh, we all found out that it was only four individuals in the community uh, that were able to have access to that. Um, another thing is uh, there's always sort of like a broken telephone when it comes to um, information being disseminated in the community. Um, and that's also something that's a priority for us, right? So making sure that every member of the community, whether they're young or old, is, uh, is sort of like in tune with what's going on um, and that they have access to this information so that they can even maybe even apply for some of these opportunities, whether they're jobs um, and so on. So like this is something that as a community we've been working on and we've been pushing forward, um, forward to, um, 
to ensure that everyone in the community has that access to those information. Um, that's one of the key things. Um, another thing that I can think about in terms of like how uh, the redevelopment is still affecting us as youth. One of the key pieces that comes to mind is that loss of like social connection, right? Like the, the sense of community in some sense is sort of broken. There's not a lot of cohesion left. You know, you have younger colleagues, people who have grown up in this neighborhood uh, for 15, 20 years, and now you have like families relocating um, and just losing that social ties. Uh, these are something that a lot of youth that I've talked to as well um, sort of like are worried about, right? Just losing that sort of connection, that social capital, and all of those things. Those are really, really important for us as well. Wow, that's amazing. You summed it up uh, really well. And, um, you know, I think like it speaks to, I think, many of the themes that we're already hearing today in terms of, you know, things like community safety, affordability, you know, inclusive local economic opportunities, decent work, you know, eliminating racial inequities, you know, as part of the process, you know, which is so important. You know, you brought up some great points around the importance of accountability and transparency, you know, within the process, right? Information sharing, communication, right? Making sure that the information is actually getting to the people in the community about what's happening, you know, or some of the, the decisions are that are being made. And, you know, I think um, social cohesion, you know, which is also a theme I think we've heard a lot about in terms of, you know, development cannot only focus just on the physical side of things, right? And the bricks and mortar, but you know, how do we make sure that we're building a community, right? And 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 this and we're we're working with people, right? And and so what does that look like? And how do we make sure that those conversations are very intentional, you know, as you know, development happens and as our neighborhood is uh, as our neighborhoods are changing. And so I want to segue to sort of a final question that I want to pose to all of our panelists. Uh, and sort of this is sort of more looking forward. Uh, in terms of, you know, what advice do you have to share for those who are new or getting involved uh, in community benefits? How would you encourage those to stay involved? Uh, and so maybe you can share a little bit of some of the work that you're doing yourself in your community uh, in organizing for community benefits. And also, what does that mean to you, right? Uh, what is the experience that you've had, you know, as you you're engaged in your neighborhood with development? Are there any suggestions that you can share with others who may be new to this type of work? Uh, and so I hope uh, we can have maybe each of the panelists maybe share a few comments on that. So I'll turn it back over to Ibrahim if you wanna lead us uh, through this uh, final question and then I'll turn it over to Beryl Ann after. What I would recommend is that uh, communities uh, when they are going through revitalization, uh, sometimes you are caught unprepared. When Region Park was being developed, uh, the first early phases, uh, there were organizations that really cared about what is going to happen to Region Park, uh, but it wasn't a coalition movement. It wasn't uh, like right now, phases uh, four and five. What we have are engaged residents, engaged grassroots, and engaged organizations. So how do we collectively demand uh, community benefit as, as a community? Uh, and my own learning, what I have learned really is that in order to be accommodated, in order to get the things that you're asking for, uh, sometimes it's very new. Uh, for phases one and two and three, the community kind of received, uh, how I say, benefits. We received the new athletic grounds, we received the Daniel Spectrum, uh, but the community right now um, is advocating and actually trying to get some of these things and say, this is what we want. Uh, and sometimes you, in, when you are facing uh, institutions, uh, they're not familiar with communities really stepping up and asking these demands. So my recommendation would be get, get your community organized, uh, get your community to know what they want. And it, it's really a struggle for power sometimes. Sometimes uh, you you might be lucky uh, and deal with somebody who is uh, uh, community minded and they might, they might give you the benefits that you're asking for. And sometimes they don't wanna deal with you and you really have to get organized and show that there is power with people, there is power with residents and then make that case up. Uh, and sometimes it's hard, the journey is so long and um, it's a tough battle, uh, but the development is gonna influence many years to come. So the, the struggle is worth fighting. Uh, so be organized. And if you have to go slow, go slow, uh, but go together. Uh, 
because the other side will sometimes use any means uh, to really um, get you to say yes. And it takes a community, I believe, uh, to really demand what they want. And it can only happen with unity. So uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, that would be my advice. Awesome. Thank Those you. are, <laughs> yeah. Berlan, do you want to jump in there and, and we take yeah, it? Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, I would recommend that uh, people get involved with people who are already doing the work in the community. For instance, I know Pagdale, um, Pagdale People Economy, they were doing the work in the community and I get involved. Um, I know there's um, this, this developer, uh, 1521 Queen Street uh, West, uh, that wants to put up, you know, a condo there, and of course, you know, um, they uh, the developer illegally ev evicted uh, twenty seven residents from that uh, from that property, and so you know, PNLT uh, took them to court, you know, saying, "Hey, you unlawfully evicted those tenants there," and now the developers a few years later saying, "Hey, we want to build um, eight stories high, build a condo there," and uh, we're saying, um, "We so we created a coalition to." fight back and say, hey, put the, um, if you replace uh, those 27 units uh, in that building, hey, we have no problem. That's what we would like. And of course, they aren't interested. They're probably looking for a different uh, demographic to be in that, on that, prop uh, at that property. And so I would say definitely, you know, create a coalition uh, in your community where residents, you know, could look at, uh, create a com community benefit uh, framework um, uh, to share with developers. And I would say even, you know, there are grassroots initiatives in the community sometimes doing those work. Uh, I would say definitely get involved uh, with those. And uh, I'm truly grateful that uh, I attend uh, Pagdale People Economy when they have their neighborhood planning meeting or they have their community meetings, I attend it. So, and, uh, you know, even uh, Sanama, you get uh, uh, the, politicians like uh, Councillor Godperks, his um, his newsletter, he sent it out to residents. Or so then when there is developments uh, uh, meeting in the, um, he sent out uh, the information to residents. So I would say, you know, I would encourage people to spread it to, to others in the community so pe more people can attend and uh, help uh, with uh, the development of their community. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Beryl Ann, and, and so many, you know, really great, um, you know, thoughts to share and, and things to take back in terms of, you know, connecting with neighbors, you know, connecting with other grassroots in your community, forming a coalition, you know, making sure that you're connecting with decision makers so that information has been able to share, you know, when development is happening in the neighborhood. Um, and thank you for sharing more about justice, justice for Queens Hotel. Right, which is a, a really important reminder of, you know, if the community is not organized and involved, you know, 27 people in Parkdale would have been displaced, you know, um, at the hands of this developer, you know, and, and so I think, um, thank you so much for just sharing that. And uh, I see uh, Trudy's in, in the uh, chat box has put power in numbers mm -hmm. and kind of reinforcing that. Trudy, do you want to speak more to, to sort of that piece and some of the work in, in Lawrence Heights and your experience? So totally. And before I didn't come on and introduce myself as the project coordinator for the Lawrence Sites Revitalization Coalition. And remember, I tell you, I was an animator before in the beginning stage before revitalization. So mind you, I was pulled left, right, center, go out there, use as a face to draw in my neighbors. Right. But then get kicked to the, you know, you know to the boot, get the boot, so to speak. Right. Because I was aligned in the wrong way. And when I say I was aligned in the wrong way, now being the project coordinator for the Lawrence Heights Revitalization Coalition, as residents, we're learning how to explore our powers. Not only that, we're working with North York Community Health and Toronto Community Benefit Network, which is learning all these tactics to go about. Because again, the end goal here, we want a community benefits agreement. We want to be at the table in terms of um, when developers are making decisions pertaining to our lives here in Lawrence Heights, right? So this is where the coalition is formed, right? We're learning about negotiating and so forth. So when you're talking about community benefits and the role that we're playing, that's just a piece of it. I'm here in, in Lawrence Heights. I'm doing the mutual aids here for, here for each other, right? That's a piece of it. I'm aligned with Don't You um, Community Legal Clinic because again, getting that scholarship, um, I've gone to school, I'm a licensed paralegal, and I'm aligned myself that way. Can again, when it comes to anti-poverty law and housing issues, 
for residents here in Lawrence Heights, I want to make sure I'm at the table ensuring that Lawrence Heights is not left behind when you're talking about benefits, whether because there's so many changes on the legal front, right? I don't want to stray too, too much. I could go on and on. But talking about, um, I wanted to just echo a lot of what Ibrahim said, right? Go slow, we'll go together because starting in 2008, when we did our grassroots um, priority and before my first child was born, right? I remember having him in meetings and today's date, phase one is still not finished. So the process is gonna be long and drawn out, right? You're gonna get discouraged along the way, but just keep, keep, keep the faith for lack of a better word right now, keep the faith, right? Um, and it's also important. A lot of people may view you as an upsetter, especially if your views and your values and vision is not in line with what they want. So you gotta be strong, keep your mental psych. psych. And at the same time, know you have the back of, of your people, the residents, right? Um, that's very important. But at the same time, don't burn your bridge because we have a lot of stakeholders that we need to work with. And what I learned in this <laughs> game, right? I wouldn't say this business, this game, right? Um, you have to be politically correct. As much as I wanna, you know, a lot of time I have to bite my tongue and just say, you know what? Um, I'm here for the people. I'm not just repre representing myself on a personal note. I'm representing the people. So that's what I wanna leave with um, um, tonight. Um, and yeah, if any questions come, I could address them. Thank you so much, Trudy. This is a, such a great conversation. I wish we had like another hour just to kind of go through some of these different things that are coming up and in the responses. This is really great. And and I see uh, Billy Keys has shared uh, in the chat box, um, you know, the importance of youth participation uh, and, and increased youth participation. And so uh, Billy Keys, did you want to maybe speak more to that point in, in terms of any ideas or suggestions or even things that you're advocating in your community to ensure that there's more youth participation within the process? Absolutely. I think, uh, obviously, you know, with the youth, I think they're sort of like the, the individuals that could bridge the gap, right, between, you know, whether it's the politicians or the stakeholders in the community, as well as the older uh, folks in the community, whether they're parents, and so on. So I think increased youth participation is absolutely important. Um, just as also as another way to sort of disseminate that information, uh, those really important information that sometimes some of our parents, because they're immigrants and so on, they you know find very hard to navigate or understand. So having that piece there, I think, is absolutely important. Um, another thing I wanted to um, sort of highlight is. Um, you know, the strength in numbers, right? Strength in numbers um, and strength in like unity as a community. When we come together as a community and we come with, uh, you know, one voice, I think there's a lot more strength in that and we're able to sort of achieve a lot more um, that way. Um, another note that I wanted to mention is, uh, so for our community, when I mentioned earlier about how, you know, there's always a lot of information and sometimes you don't know where to find it, Perhaps maybe for other communities and even for ourselves right now, we're working on that with the uh, Lawrence Heights Social Development Plan uh, to create sort of like a community website, which will be sort of like a hub where uh, different organizations in the community can post updates um, and we can all work together again for the benefit of the community so that everyone is aware of what's happening and no one else, is, no one is left behind, you know, just to carry everyone in the community along. Um, I think that would be something that would be incredible for, you know, other communities that might be going through this, having a centralized information hub um, would be great. Um, and the last thing that I want to say, in addition to, you know, being sort of uh, uh, disruptive and, and, and so on and being vocal, right, it's that we need to be very active um, in voicing our opinion and not just being passive which is something that I sometimes notice in my community, you know, we have some individuals who just sort of feel like they don't have that, uh, that power, right, to, um, that power to like effect change within the community. Um, for many people, I understand some of the reasons why they might feel that way, maybe not knowing how to navigate, um, you know, the political um, atmosphere and some of the other things, uh, but being more active, learning as we go along, you know, we're going to learn a lot of things as we go along, but just being active 
and being a part of that conversation, I think is absolutely important. That yeah, is awesome. I saw a, sorry, I saw a comment about learning how to work with the media outlets. That's very true as well. You know, just knowing how to use that that tool, the media, in a positive way to to get the things that we need for our community. I think that's something that we should uh, continue to work on as well. Yeah, that's a really great point, and, and I really liked how you sort of identified a problem in your community, but also, you know, th thought about a solution, right, in terms of creating this website, right, to ensure that more communication get, can get out into community, right, which is, you know, really great to hear. Um, thank you for sharing uh, so much. Stephen, uh, you're last up, uh, at least for this panelist questions, and then I do see that we have a couple audience questions, and so... For those in the audience, we will get to your questions and, and hopefully maybe we can have a couple panelists respond to each question uh, before we wrap up because I know we're, we're tight for time here. Uh, and so thank you everyone uh, who are, have stuck around. And so we'll hear from Stephen. We'll take a couple audience questions and then we'll wrap up for today. Yeah, thanks. I won't be too long, but I think I'll just reinforce what everyone said in respects to working with other people. I think we tend to see a lot of people working in silos and not together. And obviously we know there's strength in numbers when everyone kind of comes together and shares a unified message and, and a certain, uh, you know, just uh, uh, the same message, you know, about a certain, a certain issue or certain thing. I think just in general advice, I'd say would be, you know, to, uh, whether it's to young people, just anyone in, in the community is just to educate themselves. I think that's a big piece because uh, many individuals um, are just, you know, walking the streets and they not, not realize, not paying attention to what's going on in their communities. And so I think, um, being apathetic is no longer a like a good excuse. It's, it's no longer a good reason, and so education is a is a good a play an important role. And whether it's be, with you know North York Community House or Black Urbanism TO, like there are many organizations and many groups who are uh, playing a part in respects to educating their communities and making sure people are aware of some of the changes going on. And so I think education is going to play a, a key role in in just bringing more people to. Uh, to a movement and just add in more voices because you no know, once more people know and actually understand what's going on the better they like they can be a better advocate uh do that so yeah i just start a positive education is a key one awesome thank you so much for um wrapping up uh, the panelist questions with that uh, really important message around education and so yeah i will turn it over to a couple of the questions that have come in uh, and so I don't think we'll be able to take on all the questions, but we will be able to take a couple. Where have you learned about city planning processes and ways to get involved in decision making processes in your community? So have you learned about the city planning processes and, and ways to get involved in your community and sort of how have you been able to learn more about this? Um, and so uh, I'll open it up to any of the panelists if you if you want to answer this question in terms of your understanding of you know how to navigate the city planning process was it easy to learn about it how were you able to learn about it and how has it helped you in terms of navigating you know some of the different spaces that you're in right now uh, so uh, when it comes to the city learning process i actually learned as i went through uh, some of my advocacy uh, while i was in region park we would learn okay there's an application uh, they want to submit a rezoning and i'm like what does that mean uh, I would do, I would go to the city website and learn about the process of rezoning. And through some of the coalition members like you, Khumsa, uh, who specializes in these kind of developments, uh, learning what the process looks like and from other people. And the process is not pretty. The process is, uh, the way I see it, is one community meeting that is official. That one community meeting that's official, after that, it's all done deal. You really rely on uh, sometimes I call it a good dictator, depending on who the developer is, they can meet with you frequently before development happens and they, and they want to do outreach with you. And if you end up with the right developer who I call a good dictator, they're able to have these discussions with you and you can attempt to convert them into giving uh, as many community benefits as possible. Uh, but it's very hard to go through the city process and get them to say yes to, especially in Region Park when the developer is a subsidiary of the city itself. Uh, so with Region Park, Toronto Community Housing is the master developer and the, through subsidiary, uh, the city owns that. Uh, so we cannot, if the developer was a private developer, then the city or your councillor can really push back 
and actually ask for some benefits, uh, similar to what happened in uh, the Woodbine development, where the city actually first implemented a community benefit on document, and they really held that developer into securing these benefits before the first stone went down. The process of the city is good to understand it. And even right now they have, because of Comsa, they even have made it even faster with something called C, yeah, C2K. So that even makes it more challenging uh, for communities to advocate. So before they go through development process, uh, secure your community benefits, secure your community. And somebody have said, uh, it really, it depends on numbers. Uh, community advocacy is a, is a power game with numbers. So if you can get a lot of folks in your side who understand what is going on and, and, and unify with one voice, then you have the best advantage and the best chance. Thank you. Kumsa, can I just share quickly? I know in Parkdale, what we did is we know at 11 Brock, we know the city and the, the province and the city have a deal that you know whoever have property to sell, they'll reach out to each other first. So we remind the city that, hey, 11 Brock, uh, you know, we need to build deeply affordable housing. The, it's a, it's city owned. And so we got that. And then even with UHN, you know, the, some of the tenants who live in the building um, on Close Avenue, we got them to reach out to UHN, got the, the tenants to reach out to UHN and say, hey, let's, you know, we need to build deeply affordable housing on the property. So, <clears throat> so Sanem, all it takes is just reaching out to the developers and say, hey, even the come to benefit from one of the developers on Close Avenue, we reach out to them and say, hey, could you incorporate uh, deeply affordable housing? So hopefully we will have him be accountable for you know, what he said he would do. Yeah, those are some really great examples, Beryl. And thank you for sharing the example of 11 Brock. So for those who don't know, 11 Brock is a former former LCBO site that is owned by the city. So Parkdale recognized that as city-owned land, and they said, we want the city to prioritize this land for affordable housing, right? We heard earlier in the webinar, uh, Lauren from Los Angeles, who was sharing that, you know, in the 80s and 90s, a lot of the public land was being sold off to developers to build condos, private condos. Right. And, and so we don't want the same to happen in our communities here in Toronto, where we see these public land that's being sold off for profit rather than looking at public land to, to, for public benefit, right? Like building affordable housing, like ensuring that we can have additional community benefits. Uh, and so that's a really great example here in Toronto, where communities advocating for public land to be focused on some of the key priorities that the community has around affordable housing and to build affordable housing on that public land. And I think it's a model that the, that the city is exploring across the city now uh, with housing now, where they're looking at city owned parking lots to build housing as well now. Uh, and so I think it's a model we're going to see more and more, but that's why it's so important that the community is involved in advocating to make sure that uh, that public land is not just sold off to, you know, for private development and profit. I will turn it over to the last panel, uh, the last question. I just want to say uh, thank you so much to our panelists. You folks did a phenomenal job. I learned so much from all of you. Thank you so much. Uh, my question uh, relates to all the developments in our communities. Uh, most public developments are funded by all levels of government. My question to all of you, to all of you, uh, are you finding it challenging to bring all the players to the table uh, so that the community is not on the menu uh, so that folks in the community are driving the agenda on what uh, a people-centered development looks like, how responsible development should look like, uh, so that you know demands for a community benefits agreement or other uh, conditions for development are put uh, to the table. Uh, because when we think, when we talk about development, we like to look at the good things about development but we don't talk about the social costs of development and who actually pays for those social costs, uh, the people who are living in that community. Uh, so how do we make sure that that conversation happens with respect? Uh, because my observation is the more politically affluent communities can reject developments, but the more poorer communities are sold so many things because they, have, they basically have to compromise. So my question to all of you is, how do we not compromise? How do we demand respect for our communities? Uh, Wally, I could just add to that quickly. I know at 1521 Queen Street, we reach out to the developers because one of the things that God, the God Parks encourage uh, you know, the developers to do is to meet with the residents in the community to have a conversation about the development. 
And so we meet with, at Park, we meet uh, with the developer. And uh, of course he wasn't, uh, he was we were like, we were talking to a brick. He wasn't interested in what we had to say or the demand that we wanted to replace the 27 units that, uh, you know, was lost. Uh, and even with uh, Parkdale Hub, I just goes to give you an example. We're going to be having a hub here in Parkdale, but it didn't include any deeply affordable housing. And guess what? We, we with uh, tons of meeting we had with the developers and, and the counselors, uh, of course, now they incorporated deeply affordable housing. So it's, it's a matter of letting people know what you want and working with them to achieve what you want. I really want to be an optimist, but sometimes my true nature or the nature I try to fight is a pessimist. One of the, I do a lot of readings and some of the readings, they really told me uh, communities don't get what they deserve. They get what they have power to take. Uh, and um, there are, I, I study uh, how nonviolent activism achieves change. And there are four mechanisms. And the first mechanism, they call it conversion. And that mechanism really is for discussion, is for people to be convinced logically, morally, and whatever uh, ability that uh, persuasiveness a person has. And what I've come to realize, and this is what my brother and some folks in Regent Park have convinced me, that conversion, convincing people works. And I never thought it worked, uh, but it works. But there are some times that convincing does not work. And it really takes the community to organize and go to the next mechanism, which is accommodation. And uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, and if you look at the civil rights movement, they understood all four mechanisms and they utilized it, but each mechanism is harder to mobilize. Each mechanism demands more from the community. That is why education and looking back into history and learning from our ancestors in, in using nonviolent activism as a tool for change. And sometimes we fall short because the people we're dealing with, the institutions we're dealing with are very dictatorial spirited. And if we cannot leverage all mechanisms of change, and the last two is coercion and disintegration. And if each of them is very, very difficult. And my pessimism sometimes really kicks in that our communities don't have this knowledge of, of the past. And until we learn them, we will not get what we deserve we will get what we don't have power to achieve. So it's all about power and learning. Communities need to learn how to leverage it. So thank you. Thank you so much for those responses, Beryl Ann and Ibrahim. What are some recommendations you would give to community leaders to uh, use to gather momentum in the community? So maybe sharing some examples, she cites some of the challenges that people in her community experience that they're not interested in community advocacy for many reasons. Sometimes they get hit with legality. Sometimes it's the structure of the system. And so are there any thoughts that you can share in terms of how to get more people involved in the community and how do you build momentum? This is still something that I know that I find challenging. And I know that even within our community, in the Lawrence Heights community, we find that a bit challenging as well, getting people excited and getting them to be a part of, you know, the conversation and the overall framework, right? It's just, it's a huge challenge. And for me, one thing I noticed is that a lot of people are not excited or they don't want to be involved as much anymore because of past experiences, right? So the, for from my experience, so for example, you know, let's say that the developer promised something, they didn't um, fulfill their promise. People then sort of have this, they, they get demotivated overall, right? Um, and I think that's one thing that makes people feel like, you know, we're not gonna get anything, you know, they have a lot of power and so on. One of the ways that we could maybe sort of get people to be a lot more involved and maybe teaching them what the processes look like, right? So all those like legalities, perhaps like having sessions or seminars to teach people, okay, these are some of the processes to like present or table a motion to like the, you know, the council. These are things that we have to do. And walking, you know, community members through that process, I think would be one good way to do that. And another thing that I think is a very important part of this is starting young, right? Like most of the younger, um, whether they're teenagers or kids in, you know, middle school and so on, teaching them what, like what a process of like democracy is like in reality, right? What does that process look like? Making it something that they understand so that it's not 
like a huge concept that's very difficult um, to approach as they get older. I think that's something that we have to work on, um, whether it's through some after school program or some summer programs that we have in our community to just sort of educate some of the younger generation about what this process is look like. Awesome. Those are some, you know, really great suggestions and ideas in terms of how to get uh, more people involved and how also how to build momentum, right? And I think it speaks to, I think, a lot of, you know, some of the comments that have been shared. I think I know, you know, it's been a little bit repetitive, but I think it's been really great to reinforce, you know, the importance of things like education, right? And making sure that we're sharing the information, you know, that can help people understand what's going on and also want to get involved in their community and take more of an active role, right? We heard a lot about, you know, taking small steps, right? Um, you know, it's not, a, this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. You know, a lot of the work that we're doing is for the future generation, right? And in, in terms of how do we make sure that uh, that our future generation is not in the same place that we're currently in or, you know, where our parents were uh, before and, and you know a really great comment that you made was around starting young getting more young people involved in the community and, and this, the amount of energy that young people can bring to the space um, you know which I think we've heard a lot of, about and really encourage uh, moving forward I'll sort of wrap up because I think this conversation encapsulates you know the question that was posed as part of this series which is is history re repeating itself right and you know we're at a, such a important moment where we can let history repeat itself or we can you know be the change that we want to see for the future i would say thank you to all the panelists who are here with us today ibrahim from regent park Baran from parkdale steven from weston mount dennis as well as keese from uh, lawrence heights as well as trudy ann from lawrence heights as well thank you all for sharing more about uh, the work that you're doing uh, the really incredible advocacy and leadership that you're undertaking in your own neighborhood to, you know, be the the spark, you know, to get others involved, to build a coalition uh, and to present a vision, alternative vision for your community, right? That uh, you can demand to developers and to decision makers to make sure that uh, history does not repeat itself. Uh, and I'd also like to thank, you know, those who are behind the scenes who have made this event and, and series a really uh, great success. Uh, and so to the North York Community House team, Shannon, as well as Paida uh, and Kadeen, as well as uh, Chantel, uh, who have done a, a really amazing job in terms of providing this series and, and creating a platform for this discussion to happen. And I really hope that this is something that can continue, you know, as we uh, all engage in our really important work in our neighborhoods, that we continue to connect, uh, share, learn from each other, you know, and also, you know, see how we can sort of support our, our, each other's work collectively. Because I think, you know, another opportunity, I think, to, to really grow this movement is around solidarity. Uh, and how can we ensure that there's solidarity amongst our communities, you know, as we are involved in this journey. Uh, and so without further ado, uh, I thank you all for attending today, and I will turn it over to the planning team. who will go over some final uh, steps before we wrap up for today. Thank you. Thank you, Kumsa, so much for leading us through an excellent panel conversation. And I have to admit that when you bring great minds together, there's not enough time in the world for the conversation that ensues thereafter. So to our panelists, uh, much love, honor, and respect for all that you do in your communities, uh, for your leadership and your commitment, and for being here with us tonight for this conversation. I can certainly say that we are inspired, uh, and we being the North York Community House team, but even the Lawrence Heights community, I'm also um, a resident of, or a, a close resident neighbor, are committed and want to see more of these conversations that bring our communities together happen. Because in fact, we are having very similar experiences, wanting very similar things and have similar visions for our community, yet there are not enough opportunities for us to collectively share, exchange knowledge and experiences and, and building collective action. So we will definitely work towards making more of these conversations happen into the new year. So I'd like to say for all of our attendees as well, thank you so much for your time, your patience, uh, for staying on a little bit late with us and for your questions, of course, we know that there was so much more that we could have discussed in our time together. I am going to just offer that although we have created the webinars for your participation live, we will be uh, circulating recordings of all of the sessions so that we can continue to have access to the knowledge uh, that each of our guest presenters have brought to us over the past uh, months and for the conversations that we hope will continue to motivate 
and to encourage our communities and our residents in their participation. So keep an eye out for those videos. They will all be shared um, on YouTube and different platforms across the community. Then we say our sincerest thanks for your time again tonight. I might just ask if any of my lovely colleagues, Shannon, Chantelle or Pida, if you'd like to offer any closing comments. Thanks, Nadine. Um, I think my final comment, it's we finally reached the end of our journey. It's quite bittersweet. And I think it's safe to say that this was a learning journey for both our team as well as all the participants who supported us in, in this whole five-part webinar series. So I just want to say thank you to everybody who has participated and joined the space with us, even though we've sometimes taken you guys over time and learned with us. This has been a joint learning experience. So yes, thank you everyone for learning with us. Really appreciate it. I have just to echo what Chantal said. It was definitely a cold learning experience. I learned a lot from our guest presenters, even doing the research on um, some of the currently developing and also historically um, Black communities that have been affected by development. And I've been really enlightening, uh, enlightened. And I'm honored to have such a great team that I worked with. Such a, got to meet a lot of great people, a lot of great minds. And I'm very grateful for all the guests uh, that came out throughout all our sessions, even today as well too. So thank you everybody who uh, participated and engaged in this webinar series. And yeah, thank you. It's been a great experience. Yeah, it's going to be weird to uh, not have these webinars on Monday nights anymore. I, I, won't, I won't know what to do with my time. Um, I'll definitely miss, uh, yeah, miss being in this space. And as someone noted, it is such a unique opportunity to have all these resident-led coalitions and groups together. And it's amazing. I. I hope that we can get together soon again, um, because I, I think great things can come from this. So yeah, thank you all for being here. Thank you to the team for organizing such a great event and a special thank you for Kumza uh, for doing really well with moderating and, and asking those great questions. Thank you. And thanks to you all again. Have a wonderful night, wonderful week, and a wonderful end to the year of 2021 because it is passing so quickly i'll be happy to see you all in the new year thank you all Take care, everyone. thanks everyone Take care. lovely time night. together bye for now yes. night night happy holidays thank cheers you.